Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for being here at the Human Rights Foundation Hack North Korea program. It's Hack North Korea. It's part actually of a larger program that uh, HRF has that has been proven around the world in different uh, dictatorships and authoritarian regimes. So in order to give some context to what we're doing right now in North Korea, which is our most well-known program and how you guys can get involved in and how the technology community gets involved and all the to re answer to your questions, I have to give you some um, background on the on the work that we do. And basically, the Human Rights Foundation was started ten years ago by a Venezuelan defector, cousins with Leopoldo Lopez. His name is Thor Halverson. Uh, when he saw the injustice happening in Venezuela under the Chavez regime, he had to flee the country because of uh, political persecution. He was a political activist there as well. And the first thing that always gets attacked is free speech. So we try to focus always on, it's not your typical human rights uh, activism group. It's more based on freedom in giving activists what they need, journalists, any type of uh, political dissident around the world, including cartoonists, creative dissent, videos, uh, hackers. We, have, we work with every single person that wants to help us, including designers you're gonna see. Um, an amazing video by uh, Leo Burnett, who did our program, um, uh, Flash Drives for Freedom. And um, we basically go by the Human Rights Act of 1976, and we believe in the freedom of self-determination, the, all the, what you considered basic human rights also here in Europe, but you have to consider that most over half of the world doesn't live in a free country or a free system. It, most of them live under authoritarian regimes, like in Bahrain, where one of our speakers was just la uh, jailed a couple of years ago for speaking a poem written by her, her father, who was a political dissident, and she was 17. So, like I told you, we support uh, our dissidents. It started with Venezuela, with a global guide of your human rights. Because basically, uh, what we've learned and what our former chairmen have told us, because all of our chairmen have been pol former political prisoners, like Armando Valladares, who was 22 years political prisoner in Cuba. Uh, then we've had, um, uh, now it's Gary Kasparov. We've had Václav Havel. Gary hasn't been in jail yet. Um, but he's number one, Russian political dissident number one. Uh, what we've also focused is in trying to educate the common people and the everyday people into not buying into the, uh, the, uh, the government programs, the socialist government programs, or the just giving away money to shut you up uh, programs and just giving you a, a free and basic knowledge of what your rights are. These are some of the countries that we work in right now with the uh, human rights guides programs. There's some countries we can't even come with the human rights through like normal means, uh, which normal means for us are like people smugglers or uh, drones, balloons. You're going to see some of the other work that we've done with even slingshots. Uh, but what we did with Cuba is mostly uh, we partnered with all the fishermen around the area that delivered these human rights guides into uh, these countries by sea. Uh, we have discovered that technology can either be the largest tool for oppression and or can be the largest tool for helping people become free. So we are launching programs all over the world, uh, like the North Korea one, which is, uh, which is going amazingly well. And I hope you brought your flash drives to donate I when, if you didn't see it today. Um, and what we're trying to do is basically give all these uh, activists like Manala Sharif in the Middle East in Saudi Arabia, who's launching an app uh, for Saudi women and be, uh, so that Saudi women are being able to drive. It's like a ways, but of like where is the moral police looking for women who are driving? And she's also funding through that program and donations, licenses uh, given out in the United States and in, uh, in Delaware to Saudi women in order to create that type of creative descent. So there's always ideas, and we've found that the hacker community has become one of our most uh, valued allies. We go to DEF CON, Wired, MozFest, uh, most of the hacker conferences in order to get your ideas because that's how Flash Rose for Freedom was born. Uh, we work well, for example, with Nico Sell from the Wicker Foundation 
She's also helped us uh, do now, uh, other than Wicker, it was an idea that it was uh, through the Human Rights Foundation, but also she's now doing Whistler, which is uh, an, an app that is just designed for journalists and whistleblowers um, and dissidents around the world so that they can share with us their videos and we can put them in the, in the United Nations and all the international organisms that we work with in order to bring attention to these issues. Um, so like I told you, we started in Cuba uh, with, by bringing information in first with libraries. Uh, a lot of uh, the hacking community does work with libraries with remote uh, Raspberry Pis. We've created a mesh network in, the, in North Korea. Of the last hackathon, they created a mesh network of uh, very small Raspberry Pis inside North Korea that would actually share uh, libraries and content that we sell and send now in the flash drives. Uh, but in Cuba, we started with uh, the library as well. And one of our first uh, dissidents who got a hold of the library was Danilo Maldonado. He's a Cuban artist who read George Orwell's Animal Farm in, uh, in one of our libraries and decided to do uh, an artist, uh, artistical protest against the Cuban regime by painting two pigs, one with uh, Fidel, one with Raul, and releasing them into Havana Square where he was arrested, obviously, and tortured for three years, uh, kept in solitary confinement, kept in uh, different ways of psychological torture. He was told every day that he would be shot, uh, that his mother was already dead, different types of um, authoritarian uh, psychological destruction. Uh, we started in 2006. Uh, we, until this day, uh, three of our main dissidents have been assassinated in Cuba. Um, our North Korean dissidents, one of them got just uh, repatriated to North Korea voluntarily. Uh, and that's where our lawyers come in. Um, the Human Rights Foundation has to support all of this legally. Ha be it the, the hacking, be it like the production of apps, be it the fundraising, be it everything that we do has to be based on lawyers and international law so that we can oblige with everything on our donors and especially the U.S. Uh, government, because the, uh, the Human Rights Foundation is based in New York. And um, we fall under the legal, frame, legal framework of um, the United Nations as an international NGO. We are also uh, a special rapporteur to the Commission on Human Rights and the United Nations, which now has become useless, and I'll tell you in a little bit why. Um, these are the countries uh, in gray that are authoritarian, considered authoritarian to these days. Um, and what do we consider authoritarian? Where laws and freedom of speech have been uh, detrimented, have been shut down, dissidents have been jailed, political opposition it doesn't exist. Uh, right now, a great example is Rwanda. A great example is always China, Singapore. All these countries that one would think, no, but they have economic freedom, we always get these questions. But economic freedom doesn't mean actual freedom. And when you go into a little bit more into detail of, um, of what is considered real freedom, it's basically the, re the freedom to express yourself and uh, to your self-determination as whatever you want to be. Um, that's when we launched Speaking Freely, uh, where mostly there is now more and more countries, Turkey becoming the latest one, on uh, clamping down on free speech, passing laws that jail journalists, jail uh, opposition leaders, jail anyone because of blasphemy laws, because of defamation. Ecuador is a great example as well, uh, Venezuela. All these uh, authoritarian regimes immediately go to the honor of themselves or the glorification of the leader uh, and his honor and the people supporting him that if you offend me, you're offending everybody. And that's when you started us versus them, which uh, one of our speakers, Vladimir Karamursa, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's also one of Putin's main opposition leaders. He's been poisoned twice. He's been in coma already a couple of times. And Putin just plays with him like a little toy because he speaks his mind and he actually is achieving some type of, of, um, of change in Russia. He organizes all the protests. And his colleague Boris Nemtsov was uh, murdered outside of parliament also for speaking his mind recently, like two years ago. Uh, obviously, Saudi Arabia 
And then we have the problems uh, of that arise on how if Europe and the United States have to do business with Saudi Arabia and all these oil Gulf countries or isolate them because we don't support actually isolationism uh, because what we know and what has been studied by the Albert Einstein Institute for uh, Peaceful Protest by 198 methods that have brought down successfully authoritarian regimes and dictatorships is that um, the free information, the flow of free information is what brings down uh, these regimes, especially the main example is the USSR and the DDR, the Deutsche Demokratische Republik, because uh, the influence of Michael Jackson, the influence of all the 80s movies and everything did bring a freer sense in Bosnia and Herzegovina and a couple of the Eastern um, lying countries of the Soviet Union. Uh, at the United Nations, like I told you, we do have a seat at the Human Rights Commission because people always ask us, but why aren't you doing more against North Korea? We actually started, um, we've passed laws, I'll explain in a little bit, but whenever we try to act against North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, any one of them, they bond together and they are actually running the Human Rights Council right now. To us, it's incredible that it's Saudi Arabia, who flogs their women for bringing out the trash without a male companion, is insane that they can be actually considered human rights defenders, uh, even worse Venezuela these days. Um, one of uh, the main, uh, one, one, our main program where we educate people and we let people know and we do tech labs and everything is the Freedom Forum. It's called the Oslo Freedom Forum. It was done 10 years ago. Um, it's always held in May. And what we do is uh, we had the idea of doing TED Talks, uh, TED Talk style talks by political dissidents and by technologists and by people who are trying to help political dissidents free the world uh, in, the, in the countries that we work in. Uh, so basically what we do every year is um, it's 20 to 25 speakers, depending on the most authoritarian areas of the world. Obviously, the Middle East is a big player. This year, we had uh, Vian Dakil from the Yazidi genocide. And we've also had, uh, you guys should mark this down, September 19th, we're having the New York Freedom Forum. We're bringing the experience of the other Freedom Forum to New York, where the North Korean defector, Ji Sung Ho, will talk to you guys about how he escaped North Korea 6,000 miles on crutches. Um, then these are uh, our speaker statistics, where they come from. They've been all, every country has been represented, the US as well. We've had over uh, 3 million uh, video views every year about the Freedom Forum. These are two th uh, 2016 statistics. Uh, 2017 was just this May, but it was the most successful yet. What we're trying to do with this is basically mainstream what's going on in the dissident community. Let the unplugged housewife living in the Upper East Side of New York know that there's a girl who is a, the daughter of a, a revolutionary whose father got killed or we need to do something. So that's what we've gotten uh, the media involved, like Vogue, for example, did uh, a spread on the daughters of the revolution, which included Yomi Park our most prominent North Korean program. And we've also done the San Francisco Freedom Forum. This is Kimberly Motley, who also uh, is one of our speakers, but runs our pro bono legal advisory team. She was the one that actually got Danilo out of prison, but she was in prison herself uh, for try in Cuba for trying to get him out. And she uses now an app, uh, mostly in Afghanistan. She uh, has a huge legal program in Afghanistan that you should see. She also has a documentary called Motley's Law. It's on Netflix. Uh, and it's on how she uses technology in prisons in Afghanistan to let her know about unjustness or cases of on, the, on the Taliban. So she goes into the prisons um, and finds out and actually frees all these uh, unjust jailed people. Um, then we come to the program that I'm here for, so now that you know a little bit of what we do uh, globally. Um, Flash Drives for Freedom uh, started in 2016, uh, February 2016. 
out of a hackathon that we did at the San Francisco Freedom Forum. And basically, uh, for us, hackathons more than, um, than actually talking to you about codes or what we're going to do or the technological, more technological side of it, although we do know, I do know uh, a little bit of that. We focus on you giving, giving you all the questions we have, all the problems we're having. And most, we've gotten so many people from DEF CON and from the South by Southwest that have helped us fix, bug, fix bugs. And for example, the satellite, um, how they track the satellite, uh, the USB satellite sticks. And this is where I wanted to show you the campaign we've done. Uh, is the audio? There's a new and unconventional effort aimed at undermining the dictatorship in North Korea. Human rights activists are now collecting old USB sticks, which will be smuggled into North Korea. Getting content from the modern world into the hands of North Koreans kept in the dark by a repressive regime. In a country where total censorship is used to brainwash its people, outside information is an effective tool to make North Koreans question the government's propaganda and actions. When I saw the movie Titanic, in this movie, man can die for love. And I think that really gave me some like taste of freedom. Flash Drives for Freedom is an effort to collect flash drives. The drives are erased, filled with films, books, and Wikipedia, and smuggled into North Korea using drones and other means, then viewed on USB media players owned by most North Koreans. We encourage donations with an interactive installation where audio from Kim Jong Un's speech was silenced whenever a USB drive was inserted. While on tour, an odd thing happened. Our installation was stolen, while more expensive items were left untouched. But we built it again, and it continues to travel the world. Drives were also donated by a USB manufacturer every time our hashtag was used. Flash drives for freedom. It's a project which hopes to expose average North Koreans. Millions of hours from the outside world are already in North Korea, turning your flash drive into someone else's freedom. Basically, what we do with um, with is this on? I don't actually think I need this. Uh, sure. Uh, well, that's what we do with Flash Drives for Freedom. So, what we did out of this idea, sure. You want to? I didn't hear. Uh, on what information is put on the USB stick? Oh, so basically what we do is we are the part that collects the money and what, the flash drives. So we w make the connections and everything for the dissident groups in North Korea. Um, but I'll, like I'll tell you in a minute, you're going to see here. We've been working with North Korean defectors uh, since like the beginning of HRF. And we've made a group of North Korean defectors, a network of North Korean defectors. And they're the ones who determine what's going to go on the stick. It's not us. It's not. No, it's uh, basically out of what we did going to. Uh, we went to South Korea to work with them, um, 
And we took Jimmy Wells with us. That's why Wikipedia is there. Uh, because most of the people that most of our donors are Silicon Valley companies, like the Sergey Brin uh, Foundation, the Schmidt Family Foundation, uh, Jack Dorsey, Jimmy Wales, a couple of these people who are interested in information getting into countries, because obviously that also means more money for them. But uh, Jimmy Wales uh, didn't, uh, he, what he did was he put all of the uh, Wikipedia in the Korean in a eight gigabyte flash drive. So that's how it started. For us, it was more of like, get to know everything. Unbiased with Wikipedia, open source, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, encyclopedia for everybody. But um, yeah, they're the ones who put it on. For example, Yomi Park, who you saw in the video, who saw the Titanic, uh, she didn't see it in one of her flash drives, but it was a VHS that her sister had bought in the black market when she unknowingly cr crossed into China. So the problem that we have mostly into how to get the drone, how to get the flash drives after we've erased them, we've put in, depending on the size of what the media, the songs, everything that we've put on there, we grab and uh, we send them uh, with slingshots, literally from one side of the river into certain areas where they're waiting for us. And actually, an uh, inter interesting fact is that most of the people who distribute our flash drives inside North Korea are Korean officials, are North Korean officials. They run the black market on information in North Korea. Um, and so they're waiting for the flash drives. Uh, what happened with the balloons, this has all been trial and error over a period of five years, where we've actually pushed laws um, into action in, in, in North Korea. Uh, like you see here, we started... Oh, went off. Okay. We started in March 2016. This is Yomi, uh, who you saw from uh, the Titanic. And um, so basically, we've been working step by step by step by uniting the dissidents, which all of them used to hate each other in the, in the first place. And that happens a lot in the dissident community. They're very separated. Everybody knows what's right for their country. Uh, for example, the Cuban uh, example is very obvious that the Miami community, one of them wants to be, everybody wants to be the next president of Cuba, which is insane. And they separate themselves. And that's what we're bringing into action. These, you know, like get together tax forces and stuff like that. Uh, so when we got them together, it's her, it's Ji Sung Ho. Um, Ji Sung Ho, I'll tell you his story in a little bit. It's Ji Sung Ho, yeah. Hyun Seo Lee. Uh, and all these people decided that, okay, they're gonna fight just into getting information into North Korea. That's it. Because everybody else wanted, there was even like plots into murdering Kim Jong Un or Kim Jong Il in, the, uh, Kim Jong, uh, Il in that time. There's been different types of plans by the dissident community that never work, including uh, we've even uh, seen the, the huge speakers that they have from South Korea into North Korea that blast music, rock music, American rock music all day. And when they turn on the, the speakers, it's when you know that it's a real tension is happening into the, North, uh, the two Koreas, uh, which now uh, they have more than uh, 70 years of being separated. So what we've done in activism, like I told you, um, is we united the, the North Korean defector community and we passed, uh, we helped pass uh, lawyers, we used all of our lawyers and our legal team internationally to draft a law that would support the South Korean government into giving the North Koreans asylum. There was no type of support or no type of uh, uh, dissident support from the South to the North Koreans that were arriving in their country that were most of them making a 6,000 mile journey through China, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Burma, and uh, one of them did it on crutches. Uh, when he, after the famine of the 1990s, when the Americans, uh, American sanctions and UN sanctions started in North Korea, a huge famine was created, where more than four and a half million people died out of hunger, just in the north of Korea that borders with China. The problem is that when they China has an act that in order to not escalate the situation with North Korea, they won't interfere with the dissidents leaving their communities. So what they do is, if you're a North Korean, you're stateless basically, there's over 2 billion people that are stateless right now with Syria and it's even more. Uh, but what it means is that you don't have a name, you don't have a passport, you don't have an ID, you don't have anything. 
that's another great question that we always ask uh, the technology community. And we've had uh, now uh, answers like BitNation and uh, who's going to provide passports for these people and for other and like other types of rights based on blockchain. Um, and we actually need to find the legal framework to try to do that. And apparently Iceland is going to give their legal system as support. But it's all still very new, very, very fresh because all of these people are moving because of wars and famines and uh, floods and uh, global change and climate change. They're just moving through borders without any type of identification. So they're always being mistreated, mishandled, and uh, they end up either being prostituted or sold for their organs, uh, like in North Africa with the Eritrean community. So what we've wanted to do with, uh, it went off again. Oh, there we go. What we've wanted to do with uh, the North Korea Human Rights Act and uh, what we've, of the, um, and what we've done with, with the whole human rights program in North Korea is also expanded to other countries like Eritrea, which I just mentioned, which is uh, called the North Korea of Cuba. And even his dictator was like, no, we're not the North Korea. I'm sorry, the North Korea of Africa. We're the Cuba of Africa uh, with like, great pride. Um, so what we're trying to do is popularize the human rights situation from all over the world. And we get a lot of help from uh, social media companies, in, uh, again, in San Francisco, that provide us with funds in order to spread our message, especially the talks that you can watch online at oslofreedomforum.com. All of the talks uh, uh, from our speakers are there. There's over 350 speakers. Uh, most of them, uh, like the biggest, largest group is North Korea, so you can find their personal stories. Uh, but basically what happens with the people in North Korea is that they're so, their mind is already so changed by the time that they come out that they're, they have such a difficult time in actually up, um, getting into normal life in South Korea that most of them commit suicide, most of them defect back, there's a, there's a couple of the, that defect back, others are forced back and they're always fearing for their freedom all around the world. Even Yonmi Park, which is the most famous one, um, she fears for her life in New York. And she told me once, she's like, Oliver, I can't believe, like when I came out of North Korea, she came to school in South Korea, and the teacher asked her what her favorite color was. And she, she literally had a nervous breakdown because she was never asked even what her, her opinion was on anything. In North Korea, you have to have the, the best way to describe North Korea is like the Hunger Games and an a more extreme way of Hunger Games because what happens there is that you have to steal to survive for food because your grandparents said that the haircut on the Supreme Leader looked silly. You are literally put away into the furthest away of the small towns um, in, of North Korea that border China and you are kept in the mi most miserable of conditions with only a bag of rice, a handful of rice for a month for a person. So you have to survive out of eating grass, out of eating mud, or out of stealing carbon. That's the only export that goes into China. And they steal from the, the, the trains in order to sell it to the same corrupt North Korean government officials uh, for another handful of rice. And Ji Song Ho, uh, who's our, our another North Korean defector, he was so hungry when he was a teenager that he passed out on top of the train, fell under the train, and that's how he loses his arm and his leg. But instead of getting help or medic uh, or anything, what actually kept him alive were his brothers, because his parents had already died, his mother had already died. Uh, his sisters and his brothers kept him alive with tourniquets, gave him their portions of rice to him. They were eating... Uh, grass and their growth was actually stumped because of what uh, of uh, they of the food the malnourishment that they were having one of them also died and Ji Sung Ho never lost hope because he would always get information from the same corrupt officials that yeah Kim Jong-un is uh, gonna fall any day now yeah the Kim family will fall and they keep they keep playing these mind games on people that if we can actually break that mind spell that what it, what Flash Drive for Freedom does, that's when, well, like Yomi said, I watched the Titanic and I couldn't believe that a man could profess his love for a, for a woman. That's insane because in North Korea, you can only profess your love for the Supreme Leader. 
And that's the only person that you're allowed to love. And if you have a potato growing in your ground, that's not your potato. That's the supreme leader's potato. And if somebody finds you eating that, you'll get gulagged, killed, shot. The stories are immense. And the disgrace of the government is so shameful that the government hasn't acted in the way that they should. So we think that instead of actually combined with our work supranationally in the international organisms, we are working with the people on the ground because they're the only change makers. And we've seen it now with our program in Venezuela that's now actually giving fruits as well with uh, Mesa de Unidad Democrática, which is the main opposition party with Leopoldo Lopez and, uh, and the Venezuelan dissident community. So, um, in a second. This, uh, we do have tech labs uh, at the Oslo Freedom Forum where we always have the big uh, privacy and security companies work uh, because that's one of our main issues, uh, trying to protect political dissidents and journalists who are always hacked, who are always, their websites are always brought down, their, um, uh, like our Flash Drives for Freedom program has, like you saw, it's also been stolen a couple of times two times uh, out of the storage lots of the hotels that it's been on. And uh, it's this systematic type of malware bugging that we have now from especially North Korea coming into the US because um, the new way of making money for North Korea now that, they are, uh, that the sanctions have increased is by stealing money from banks. So they have a very sophisticated hacker community inside North Korea who is actually hacking banks. You've seen now the HBO hack, uh, the Sony hack, uh, and it's mostly the same type of Russian, Chinese, and North Korean influence in the coding. Um, it's incredible also that the FBI is just putting this together when this has been already announced a couple of years ago at DEF CON uh, 2014 on the Russian uh, on the Russian hackings that were happening and they all share hackers including the Cubans and uh, we just found out this from the German parliament that they can't do anything mostly in Cuba because Cuba is supported so well by the Russian hacking community as well that the, all their all the all the information that comes into Cuba is only these news channels that the oppressive regimes have uh, have created, which brings us again to media. Media controls the mind of the individual. Media is what gives you the freedom to see of what you could achieve, what you could get, what you could buy, how you could live, what you attempt to achieve on. But then you have Russia Today, uh, which is uh, a very uh, Russia uh, state-owned media company, which just basically uh, mixed with its real news, does very uh, pro-Russian covering of the, of the media, as well as Telesur, for example, in South America, very communist media outlet. And we're countering that with, for example, Real Russia Today, where we respond to every single uh, fake news story from Russia Today. Um, and uh, then we have the, for, if there's anybody of you guys that are still in college, or that are still out there. We do have an Oslo Scholars Program where you can come to Oslo uh, and act, volunteer with the political dissidents from around the world and help them spread their message. Uh, for example, another, uh, we just hooked up some people with Abdelaziz Alhamza, who uses technology in order to spread, uh, to bring awareness to the crimes of ISIS in Syria. He's the founder of Raqqa is being slaughtered silently. We also, uh, put him in contact with uh, David Heinemann, who is now the who produced his um, who produced his documentary, which you should go and see. It's called City of Ghosts, and which resumes what we do very well, because the information is what we've also used in the fight in Syria against ISIS. We've used the same ideas of flash drives and the Raspberry Pis in order to achieve a network between Turkey and Syria uh, with another uh, dissident group that we work in Turkey called Turkey Blocks because Turkey is falling into an authoritarian regime very fast as well. And so this is the Oslo Scholars. We do bring the, college, uh, the forum to colleges. We've done it at Yale, Stanford, um, MIT. 
and a couple of others. And we're located in the Empire State Building. Uh, this is our board. As you can see, this is Gary Kasparov. And then we have uh, various dissidents from around the world, from different parts of the world. And most of us, uh, most people ask me, how can I get involved? What can we do? What we look for is basically your time. Your money or your time? One of the two. Or if you, can, you have an idea on how to make us money. Like for example, we go to Catapult also in Norway and they are basing now all of this on Bitcoin. I was like, okay, donate like one Bitcoin. You know, like give me something that I can actually support these people for. Because the problem with dissidents is that they have no money. No money at all. And every single dissident will tell you that they spend all of their income in just helping people get over the, like, uh, out of the human rights abuses, be it child brides in Nepal or be it uh, Eritrean survivors. So we're looking for your time, your expertise, your ideas, uh, a way to hack the, the, the problems that we have in North Korea, uh, which one of the main ones is if you get caught with a flash drive, you mostly risk death. So what, what we've done from another hackathon is that they've, um, they've encoded uh, the information into a, a game like Snake, like the basic Snake inside of the flash drive. So they would, when they'd open it, it'd be the, the game. But then we have the other pro pro problem that if they've never even seen like basic technology, how do you know that the little game holds information and how do you extract it? So how do we make all these technological situations in mind so common in human rights basic that people can use it in order to help free themselves and access information? Yeah, they're Nortels. They, yeah, they use Nortels. You saw it in the film as well. It's where they put the flash drives. And what happened was uh, China, in order to make good by the UN regime, after siding with the US in a UN resolution in 1998, uh, basically bought the, the pop popular favor in North Korea by giving them that. So they literally imported into the country all this stuff to promote North Korean media so that people could watch in their homes North Korean media. But the uh, one error they did it that they didn't see is that they came with a flash drive. Yeah. What, what stops the, uh, the government to, to try and detect your... Uh, oh, no, no, they do detect it. Of course. Yeah, we've gotten... Um, so the response from the North Korean government. The response from the North Korean government is to send drones and balloons back with their own information. Uh, so we've had, yes, because it's, it's not only the flash drives, we send little boxes, it's like little help boxes. So in the box you find a map on how to escape, escape routes, money, and all this stuff. And of course if one of the boxes gets found, you, but you are, at least you're going to know this, where your country is, where you're at. You know, it's, these people have no idea where they're even located, where they live, or if there's anything else outside of this. It's incredible when you talk to these people, uh, like you have uh, Ji Sung Ho's family, for example, they, they were tortured and murdered and, and left in their house just because they stepped into the Chinese territory and, and without papers. And they were brought back. And since he is disabled, uh, he was tortured because he's a disgrace to the Supreme Leader. And it's stupid it's stuff like that. So what the Korean government is, that they send also the leaflets, we send plastic leaflets that have the information on it, and they send them back with, uh, they've captured some of our drones as well. We, they, we do get a lot of death threats, but they're not the only ones. Um, so yeah, there's the different ways, because for, we work with every single person that has something to say, and we will defend your right to say it always. For example, we work with uh, Charlie Hebdo, head columnist, uh, uh, and, and she's the most persecuted woman in the world by ISIS and you know but she has the right to say it's called her talk is called the right to offend you should see it it's very good and it's also technology based and to protect freedom of speech yeah uh, you would say that prevention is better than curing so do you guys do anything in let's say Poland where they're now kind of drifting off in a more authoritarian space yeah uh, the same happens with Turkey. Yeah. Uh, 
the thing is that we've just started the first task force. Like, imagine the, the problem with us is that we need the money to fund every single program. We're a medium-sized organization. It's only 18 people. And we do have specially legalized teams on sections of the world. But for every person you, you have to hire, you need to have the money, you need to have the program. Like the, our most basic program costs around $60,000, which is not much. But we have to go through a rigorous system of like justificating why Poland should be in our countries of authoritarianism. So we do have like the free speech index that I showed you that we did. Uh, where we measure authoritarianism mixed with like transparency and uh, where, where those levels are. And Ecuador is the first country that we're actually educating people before it falls into more authoritarianism. It's like midway Venezuela and now, yeah, Colombia is also starting and Mexico is also starting and it's expanding everywhere. The United States, everybody asks me, like, why are you going to start in the United States? Yeah. Um, <laughs> The United States is not considered, at least there is separation of powers in the United States. It's been proven once and over again in this administration and other administrations as well, because the Obama administration also did a lot of executive orders and everything, obviously not that insane. But uh, yeah, so the United States still has, excuse me? Visa court? No, visa court? You call that separation of powers? Uh, the, what's happening right now in, uh, in the US? Yeah. With the visa systems for the Middle East? FISA, FISA, the FISA. secret courts. The FISA. secret courts? Yeah, the FISA oh, courts. I don't know much about that. I but couldn't tell you about that. Yeah. No, but you still have separation of powers. He has been stopped. You know, it's not when you compare yeah, it. That should have been just put down as president a long time ago, and he's not. But it's, power. yeah. So you but it's also a system, it's bureaucracy. You know, and I do agree with you that, for example, uh, that's another whole conversation, but the Electoral College or all this underrepresentation, Trump didn't win actually, you know? The Americans are not that stupid. You have two? Two news sources in the States. News stories? Sources. News sources, yeah. And when you find out what, how Fox and actually Rupert Murdoch did all of it, it's even more disgusting because he's been doing it in, the, uh, in England for a while. And it's been in, the U in Europe for a while as well. You have, look at all over Europe. You have all these magazines and everything, but that's freedom of speech. When you don't have, start wearing, when you don't see like the nudie magazines and all the crazy stuff and all the trash information that they put to in front of you, that's also freedom. You are allowed to say stupid shit. You are allowed to. And you're also allowed to offend. North Koreans, they argue that yeah. the American propaganda is so insidious, so infectious, and so poisonous 